Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for coming to this new or relatively new CSIS um, building, despite the weather. And uh, today, we're very uh, pleased to host Mr. Keisuke Sadamori. He's the Director for Energy Markets and Security at the International Energy Agency, which is based in Paris. Uh, and he's here to present the IEA's uh, midterm coal market report. This report is part of the uh, IEA's midterm report series. And it gives us an IEA forecast on coal markets for the, the coming five years, as well as an in-depth analysis of recent developments in global coal demand, supply, and trade. Um, you already have his bio in front of you, but uh, I will just give you a very uh, a brief version of it. Uh, Mr. Sadamori has been with IEA since 2012, and uh, he... Um, monitors uh, things other than coal, I mean, uh, global oil markets and also uh, energy supply uh, uh, situations. Uh, prior to joining IEA, he was, um, uh, he was with the uh, Minister of Economy, Trade and Industry uh, of the Japanese government, and he has held various uh, uh, important posts, including uh, uh, his uh, uh, position as the executive assistant to the prime minister in 2011, when the Great, Earth, uh, Great East uh, Japan earthquake and tsunami hit Japan, uh, which, as you may know, uh, triggered a Fukushima uh, nuclear plant accident. Uh, and he has, he has also been the uh, Japanese representative to uh, numerous international energy fora, uh, including IEA governing board. So uh, without further ado, uh, please um, uh, uh, share your um, insights. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Ms. Nakano, uh, for the uh, nice introduction. And uh, yes, uh, the, my name is Sadamori. I'm from the IEA. I'm the director of the, uh, the Energy Markets and Security at the IEA. So my responsibility is the, the emergency response, you know, emergency preparedness and uh, the oil market monitoring, as well as uh, the, the, the market analysis of uh, gas, coal, power, and also recently the renewables, uh, because uh, renewable is no longer about the R&D story, but the actual deployment. Uh, and uh, in, in some regions, uh, they are already competing with the other uh, fossil fuel sources without any subsidies. So, so that's what I do at, at, the, at the IEA. And also, it's nice to be back to this town, because I used to work at the embassy uh, in Washington, and that's uh, more than 15 years ago, but uh, the, so I was uh, here uh, as the embassy staff uh, from uh, 1998 through uh, 2001. So it's always a pleasure uh, to, to come back to the city because uh, the, this is where the action is in terms of the various uh, uh, policy issues. Now, uh, thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So uh, it is a pleasure for me to present the IEA's uh, the medium-term coal market report in 2013. As explained by the moderator, so this is part of the uh, medium-term market reports uh, on oil, uh, the gas, renewable, and coal. And uh, we just uh, launched this uh, last month uh, at the IEA. And uh, now uh, this is my first time to be, uh, to be presenting this uh, at this uh, Washington. And now, uh, there is no denying the uh, controversial reality of coal and its dominance of power generation worldwide. So no field draws the same ire, particularly for its polluting qualities both locally and in terms of uh, uh, the CO2 emissions. And yet no field is as responsible for powering the economic growth that has pulled billions out of uh, energy poverty in the past decades. So as we look to the long term, we must ask what role coal has to play in the energy mix uh, that we want to achieve because there will be a role. But without the mitigating the polluting effects of coal, the pursuing business as usual will have an enormous uh, tragic uh, consequences. So uh, before going to the uh, specific findings of the medium-term coal market report 2013, which covers five years uh, towards the 2018, let us take a look at the longer-term perspective based on the, uh, the, the other flagship publication of the IEA, which is the World Energy Outlook uh, 2013, which covers the year toward the uh, 2035. Now, here is the, uh, the world energy demand by fuel from uh, 1980 to 2035, long outlook. And you can see easily that uh, coal has grown fastest among the uh, all fossil fuels, all fuel sources, not only fossils, 
in the first 10 years of this century. And, uh, and this is mostly coming from the uh, very rapid growth of China. And the future outlooks toward the 2035, that's in the dotted line. And this dotted line is based on the, the NPS, new policy scenario, uh, which is the central scenario of the world energy outlook, and uh, which assumes the continuation of the existing policies and implementation of the policies that have been announced by governments but are yet to be given effects. So in this NPS, coal will grow at a solid pace in the near future, but not uh, faster than other uh, uh, field sources. But, the, uh, but it depends upon the, uh, which scenario in the wheel that you look at. So for instance, the 450 PPM scenario, which is uh, shown in the green bar, uh, which shows that uh, the 450 ppm scenario shows what it takes to set the energy system on track to have a 50% chance of keeping to a 2 degrees Celsius in the long-term increase in the average global temperature. In this case, coal consumption must go down drastically, and only gas uh, is allowed uh, to grow among the fossil fuels. On the other hand, under the uh, CPS, current policy scenario, which only takes into account the policy already exists, the coal will overtake oil and will continue to grow as the largest fuel source toward the 2035. So if we take the current policy scenario, the future outlook in the last slide would be different. So coal will overtake oil demand around the 2020, which would be similar to the projection in the medium term, the market reports. So uh, the, I will show this to you later. So therefore, like it or not, the coal is here to stay for a long time to come. Another uh, fundamental point about coal is that it is abundant and uh, geopolitically secure. Even in the old sector, recently the high oil prices and the improvements in technologies like fracking have enabled the production levels uh, formerly unseen. Overall, the remaining energy sources around the world will not constrain the projected energy demand in the foreseeable future. But among such fossil fuel sources, abundance of coal is uh, outstanding. And as you know, the majority of coal is used for the power generation. And the iron steel production is the second largest use of coal, but that represents around 5% of coal use. And uh, the outlook for the power generation in non-OECD countries, coal will continue to be the dominant generation fuel. Coal-fired plants are easily integrated into the existing power systems, and modern plants are very flexible, so providing affordable base load factor while backing up the variable renewable generation as well. So uh, the, uh, this is the, uh, the, the, about the world energy outlook, uh, the entire global picture, but energy demand growth will be led by China and India and other Asian countries. And for the next decade, China will be the main driver of the global energy growth. And uh, especially in the world of coal, uh, China is dominant. China has half of both the uh, global production and consumption of coal. So in China, the scale of coal in the economy is simply incomparable to fuels elsewhere. So replacing coal with gas in Chinese power generation would require twice the volume of all global LNG trade. So coal therefore continues to play an important role in the economic growth and energy security worldwide. And after 2020 to uh, toward the 2035, it would be the India who would lead the global coal growth uh, instead of China, which would drastically slow down. Now, uh, I need to add that uh, it is not only China and India. The, uh, there's another publication by the, uh, the IEA, which is the World Energy Outlook, uh, Southeast Asia Energy Outlook. So this was uh, released uh, last, uh, was it September? I guess, yeah, September, at the time in, in the margin of the, uh, the ASEAN Energy Ministers meeting. And uh, according to this outlook, uh, the, if we continue the current path, the ASEAN's generation will, 
generation mix, we'll see a drastic change. So coal-fired power generation, which currently generates around uh, 200 terawatt hour, that's about 30% of the entire generation in 2011, will grow to more than 400 terawatt hours in 2020, and uh, more than 900 terawatt hours in 2035. That would be the growth of 6% per year. And, uh, and as a result, in 2035, the coal will take about half of the entire generation in that ASEAN region. On the other hand, the gas-fired generation will increase modestly by around 2% annually. So the, the gas power generation will lose its share from 44% in 2011 to 28% in 2035. I need to add that the more than 70% of the coal power generation built uh, under construction in this region are of subcritical type, which is the inefficiency, uh, low efficiency type of the uh, power generation plant. And that leads to the point that uh, coal in its current form is simply unsustainable. So coal-fired heat and power generation is the biggest single source of carbon dioxide emissions resulting from fuel combustion today. And more than three-fifths of the rise in global CO2 emissions since 2000 is due to the burning of coal to produce the electricity and heat. And we should not overlook the health problem tied to the local pollution produced by the coal combustion. And uh, as, you as you can see in this slide, the majority of the new CO2 emissions are coming from the non-OECD countries. And even on an accumulated basis, since the uh, year to, uh, 1900, uh, non-OECD would reach almost the same level as the, the OECD countries uh, in uh, 2035. Even though we have known how to build efficient, uh, super, ultra critical, ultra super, I forgot, the, uh, the kind of a very high efficiency coal-fired power plant since the uh, 1960s. Most of the coal, coal plants built since then, and a large proportion of uh, ones are being developed today, in particular in the non-OECD areas, are of that inefficient subcritical kind. If these subcritical plants under development in India and ASEAN states, uh, including the Indonesia, were completed with the latest existing technology, it would save as much CO2 as would be saved by all the wind turbines in Europe. So when it comes to the uh, sustainable energy profile, we are simply off track, and uh, coal in its current form is the uh, prime culprit. Yet with coal set to remain an integral part of our energy mix for the decades to come, the challenge is to make it cleaner and more efficient. So what I stated above is the uh, long-term perspective as a background to this uh, medium-term coal market report. And now let me move on to the findings of the medium-term coal, medium coal market report 2013. Uh, we released this uh, in December last year. So this is a book. Now, uh, this slide serves to underline the point that uh, not only uh, coal is here to stay, but coal demand growth is also not showing any signs of stopping. Over the next five years, additional coal production capacity of a half million tons per annum will be added worldwide each day. And that will be necessary to meet the worldwide demand increase of uh, around 2.3% per year on average until 2018. Every year, the coal continued to grow more than oil and gas. So in 2012, China and the United States had abnormally low coal consumption. And I will come back to this point later in the presentation, but even with this abnormal drop in the growth in China and in the United States, the coal grew more than oil and gas. If nothing changes, uh, coal will catch up with oil as the world's uh, biggest uh, primary energy source in the foreseeable future, and uh, nobody can be surprised in accordance with the uh, recent trends. And uh, in 2012, China surpassed the rest of the world in coal consumption, and this is in energy terms, not in terms of physical tons. And what is remarkable is that the growth in China is projected to be much lower than it used to be. So we assume strong economic growth in China. However, our projections for the Chinese coal growth are much lower, and that's 
2.6% per year on average. And this gap comes from the efficiency both in the production and consumption of the electricity, diversification away from coal in, uh, in non-power uh, sector all around the economy, and the rebalancing to a less uh, coal-intensive economy. Now, on the other hand, the coal conversion emerges as a, as a demand driver with potential to increase the coal demand. And I will also come back to this point later. And uh, so this is what happened in China in 2012. So coal demand growth in China in 2012 was uh, only 4.7%, uh, and that's the second lowest in the decade. Comparing the historical trends uh, with the 2012, we noticed that the three factors that could explain the low coal demand growth in China of uh, 2012. And the first, the GDP growth was 7.8% in 2012. Uh, and that's lower than the average in the, uh, with the past trend. Over the last decade, China has grown uh, over 10% per year on average. Second, the elasticity of power in relation to the GDP was uh, 0 0.74. And this is the third lowest level in the decade with an average of 1.1. Uh, so that's the, uh, was it a yellow or green? I don't know. I mean, and uh, so the third, in 2012, the hydro production in China was 23% higher than in 2011. So almost all the uh, extra hydro production resulted in less coal power generation. Uh, if we uh, this is the OECD, uh, the, the coal demand outlook. So if we turn to the OECD, OECD outlook to the uh, 2018, the general trend is flat. But the picture at the regional level is more nuanced. So in the United States, uh, which is the uh, blue line, uh, the demand will largely depend on the coal and gas price evolution. So another important factor is the retirement of the uh, coal fire plants, and which will be more important in 2015 uh, due to the mercury and air toxic standards taking effect in January at the beginning of uh, 2016. In Europe, which is a red line, the coal, gas, and CO2 prices are expected to continue to give a cost competitive advantage to coal over gas. But uh, we consider that most of the gas to coal switching has already occurred, and the slow economic growth and more renewables will drive out the uh, thermal generation production. So significant new coal capacity are expected in Germany and Netherlands, but there will be also be the significant retirements in both countries and in others, especially in the United Kingdom. And therefore, so, so uh, we, don't, we don't believe that the coal will continue to grow in Europe. It will uh, uh, finally decline uh, slowly. But in Asia, high gas prices and concerns about the nuclear power generation plant will make the coal plants run at the high load factors. So we expect solid growth in OECD Asia, Japan and Korea. All in all, the OECD coal demand in 2018 is forecast to be about the same as it was in 2012. So the, we saw in the latest last slide that in OECD countries, growth in Asia offsets declines in Europe and US. And here we see the most of the coal demand growth comes from Asia, also in the non-OECD countries. So this is moving trade on the center of gravity uh, towards east, which impact on the uh, price setting as well. Now, uh, let, let us see, but who is more coal dependent? And uh, if we take a look at the coal consumption on a per capita basis for the power generation, we might be surprised to see how per capita consumption in places like Australia, uh, United States, and Germany is bigger than in China. And actually, China and Denmark's per capita uh, coal consumption are quite close. And on the other hand, we can also see that the low level of per capita consumption in countries considered as the coal places like India and Indonesia. Now, uh, so, but it is not only in Germany and Denmark that depend on coal in Europe. The, with cost advantage of coal over gas, as I said, the European countries, Germany, Spain, UK increased the coal consumption in the last few years. 
Some call it the uh, golden age of coal in Europe. But, but, uh, the, the, but that cost advantage of coal in Europe is nothing comparable to the cost advantage of coal in Asia region. So this slide shows the price of coal, and that's in dark blue, the lower line. And gas, that's in red, the, the, the higher line. And the purple bars indicate the CO2 prices necessary to make gas as competitive as coal, taking into account only the variable costs. Uh, because uh, given that the new investment decisions cannot materialize within our outlook, you know, medium term outlook period, we do not consider the capital costs for this comparison. So this is purely about the fuel switching in short term. If we consider the capex factors, then the price would be lower, but still significant. And it is evident that the why coal plants will work at high load factors in Japan and Korea. And uh, this uh, break even carbon cost, so to say, is currently around 140 or 150 US dollar per ton. And uh, you know that uh, the, the carbon prices in Europe right now is less than five euros or in the US dollars, that'll be $7 probably per ton of the CO2. So, so you, you can see that uh, this $150 per ton is something not possible uh, in the foreseeable future. And uh, in order to give the scale of how this impacts on the electricity prices, this uh, $150 per ton would translate to around uh, $50 per megawatt hour or five cents per kilowatt hour for gas and uh, $125 per megawatt hour or 12.5 cents per kilowatt hour for coal. So you can see that uh, the, the kind of a level of impact of this level of uh, carbon pricing comes in order to make the coal and gas uh, the, the, the equally competitive. Now, uh, let me talk about a little bit about the coal trade, and that's growing faster but moving east. And uh, in this map, the uh, countries in blue, they are the exporters, and uh, the, the green countries are some of the uh, significant uh, the importers. And uh, uh, what this chart shows are projections for the thermal coal trade in 2018. So the Pacific Basin has two biggest exporters, as you know, the Indonesia and Australia, as well as the biggest importers, China, Japan, India, Korea, and Taiwan. Therefore, it concentrates most of the seaborne trade with increasing share. In the Atlantic Basin, on the left-hand side, uh, the uh, Colombia and the United States are the main exporters uh, with the European receiving most of the coal. South Africa and uh, Russia, they are the uh, kind of a swing suppliers and uh, increasing their sales to the Pacific Basin. So especially countries like South Africa, they used to ship most of their coal to the European countries, but now it's more and more moving toward the uh, Pacific side, uh, providing even to the countries like Japan. So, uh, so, so uh, the, the, those thermal coal trade continues to move east, and uh, that would uh, have a, a kind of impact on the, uh, the, the, uh, the price setting uh, in, in the global trade. On the supply side, the main expansions take place in Indonesia and the Australia. Uh, about the prices, uh, the, we see in this chart how prices have shown a declining trend in both steam and uh, metallurgical uh, coal. Steam coal prices, for example, declined from over $120 per ton to below $80 per ton, and that's a 35% decline. So both steam and metallurgical coal prices are in the low part of the uh, traditional uh, boom and bust cycle, and mostly coming from the uh, current oversupply. The chart at the bottom, I'm sorry, it's a kind of small one. <coughs> so, uh, this one shows how the fossil fuel uh, prices have evolved since 2005. And we can see that the, 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 the oil prices are now 2.5 times uh, what they used to be in 2005. And gas prices in Europe are twice what they used to be. And coal, but coal prices are almost the same as the uh, 2005 levels. And of course, uh, this story would not be complete without the gas prices in US, and that's in red. 
and uh, which is a lot lower compared with the uh, 2005. So although the uh, coal demand is not so price elastic uh, in some regions of the world, but uh, it is obvious that the low prices would mean, uh, would lead to the, the higher demand of coal. Now, uh, we often hear that the shale gas production in the United States is driving coal prices down in Europe and worldwide. And uh, yeah, indeed, uh, the shale gas was one of the reasons, but not the only one. Uh, for instance, the US winter of uh, 2012 was mildest one in decades, so it's a lot warmer than this year, obviously, and uh, leading to the uh, lower gas demand for the heating and thermal generation. So this caused the high gas inventories in spring 2012, with Henry Hub gas prices at the time breaking the level of uh, $2 per million BTU. And this is a very well-known story, especially in the United States. And this decreased coal consumption, that's uh, equivalent to the around the 200 terawatt hour switched from coal to gas from 2011 to 2012. The thermal coal exports from the United States increased. But if we put this in perspective, we see that the expansions occurred in all those big countries, especially Indonesia and Australia. So therefore, we need to consider that the US only, was only a kind of a part of the current oversupply. Now, uh, the one point about the United States is that uh, the, uh, the picture of what happened in the United States in 2012 is not complete if we do not mention this uh, coal fire plant retirement. Over 10 gigawatt in 2012, mostly driven by the EPA regulations, were decommissioned. And uh, even if the retired coal power plants are usually the old and efficient ones, and hence with low load factors, there's an impact on the coal demand, of course. And uh, as mentioned before, the, we expect the big retirements again in 2015, as the new standard on the mercury and air level is enforced since the, uh, the uh, 1st of January in 2016. Uh, there's a kind of misconception uh, on the U.S. coal that uh, all coal which was not consumed in the United States was uh, simply exported to Europe. In this chart, I'm sorry, it's a bit hard to see, but in this chart we can see that the coking coal exports were flat in 2011 and 2012. That's a red part, almost the same height. And only one quarter of the 100 million tons of decrease in coal demand in the United States was exported. So out of about 100 uh, less coal demand in the United States, around uh, 26 million tons, so about a quarter, were exported. And that was mainly to the Europe, sure. So now, so, so that, that's shown in the, in this, uh, the change of the uh, thermal coal exports. So we have seen a little bit of increase, but that, that's not all. So, uh, so, so the coal not used in the United States did not go to Europe. So the question is, uh, where did it go? And uh, we have seen the various uh, the newspaper reports about this thing is that, uh, well, it's actually uh, the US coal, the, uh, so this is the answer. I mean, the, so the industry had to face the, uh, the, the overcapacity and uh, had to reduce the production. So they are still uh, remain, remaining under the ground. So, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the so they had to reduce production by around uh, 70 million tons, as we saw in the last slide. So this has produced a significant loss of jobs, especially in regions like Kentucky or West Virginia. So the job creation in shell gas has implications in other sectors. Of course, this is part of the economy, but, uh, but, but, but I think that we should be aware of this. And uh, the, the coal market in the United States is uh, rather complex, with a majority of long-term contracts and uh, sophisticated logistics. But in a simple analysis, we see that the Central Appalachian and the Powder River Basin accounted for most of the decline. Whereas it seems logical that Central Appalachian, Central Appalachian regions, uh, probably the highest cost region in the United States, suffered a big cut, we think that the Powder River Basin, the lowest cost, lowest cost coal in the United States, is more related to some of the retirements shown in a few slides ago. So without the desulfurication units and hence 
consuming the low sulfur coal from Powder River Basin. So they are, they are mostly uh, de decommissioned and retired. So that's the reason why the, uh, the powder, powder River Basin coal has been hit uh, in recent years. And this is about the uh, Chinese, uh, the, the, the coal conversion. So we used to consider that the coal to liquid and coal to gas kind of conversion has been considered, you know, they were non-economical. But nevertheless, there are a few considerations that we should, we should take into account now. And first, the, yeah, of course, that the coal to liquid and coal to gas conversion is expensive, but now we are seeing the very high prices of oil and gas, especially in the Asian region. Secondly, the coal to gas or the coal to liquid processes, that they are ideal for the uh, stranded coal in China, especially. That is the coal that is uh, low cost, but low quality and far from the demand centers. And third, especially the coal to gas conversion with pipeline networks, if it works, could address the problem of rail transport of coal in China. So during the next five years, the coal gasification will contribute more to the uh, China's gas supply than shale gas. While there are many uncertainties about these technologies, the potential scale of projects in China involving coal to produce the uh, synthetic natural gas and synth synthetic liquid is enormous. So if this were to become reality, it would mark not, not just an important development of coal markets, but would also imply the revisions to the gas and uh, oil market outlooks. So thank you very much for your patience. So, uh, so this is a wrap up. So coal demand will grow at 2.3% per year on average to reach almost 9 billion tons in 2018. And let me remind you that in 2000, coal demand, global coal demand was less than 4.8 billion tons. So it's a huge rapid increase. And we believe that the policies of the new government in China will slow coal demand growth, but we do not project peak coal in China in our outlook period. And the OECD coal demand will be basically flat as Japan and Korea will offset declines in other OECD economies. Indonesia and Australia will lead export growth and Australia has increased production costs recently, but it's still competitive. And finally, after some years of uncertainty, it seems that the coal conversion is chi in China is taking off, but its scale will depend on the environmental and other uh, issues. So thank you very much for your, your, your patience, and uh, so that's it from me. And I'll be happy to field any questions that you may have. Thank you. Uh, just a quick question um, before I open the floor to more of a general questions. Uh, the, the second point about the, the peak, um, the Chinese uh, demand peak, Mr. Sadamori, so you said that through 2018, you don't expect it. In the, the longer version or the, um, the, the WIO uh, 2014, uh, do you discuss when that may happen? Would it, I mean, when before 2035 that may happen? Or would it be beyond the horizon? Uh, that, that's a valid question, and uh, because this is about the uh, medium-term market reports, so uh, we do not, uh, so this is not based on the uh, scenario analysis. Okay. While in case we all, so it depends. I mean, uh, if we take the, uh, the more kind of a, the sustainable uh, type of scenarios, then uh, Chinese uh, coal demand must decrease. But uh, uh, so, so I have to say that uh, the, it depends on the scenarios. And uh, it all comes down to the individual, uh, the, the, the climate change and the energy policies that the individual country would have. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, now I invite um, anyone here to um, ask questions. And uh, just the ground rule, uh, if you could please identify yourself and uh, uh, let us know who you're with, and then ask the question, a formal question. Thanks. Thank you. Sure. Uh, my name is John. I work for Whitestone Capital, and uh, we trade commodities. And I have a question about India coal. Uh, as you, as you well know, the, they've set quite ambitious uh, goals to import more and more coal over the years. Um, what, um, they're getting most of their coal out from Richards Bay and Newcastle and Kalimantan. Uh, do you think that if coal were to, coal production there were to 
max out at some point and they had to still hit targets, would they start calling up more sources in the U.S. to import uh, from other sources? So your question about the, the, what, the, the Indian mm -hmm. increase of imports from which country? So uh, From the Asia-Pacific Asia region plus South Africa. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, if, they have to get, if they have to keep getting more and they're not hitting their targets from their current supply, do you think they'll look to the U.S. and maybe Colombia or, or Russia uh, to meet those uh, demands? Yeah. I, I think it depends. I think it depends. Uh, the, there's no doubt that uh, the, the India will increase the, 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 uh, the, the coal imports. And uh, soon, uh, the, instead of China, India will be the biggest, uh, especially the, the, the biggest uh, importer of coal in uh, the, over the, on, in the uh, uh, over, overseas, you know, the, the, the coal. And uh, uh, the, from which country, uh, I think it depends. Uh, the, I can only say that uh, there are enormous resources abound in, the, uh, the, in the, the ASEAN region. You know, Indonesia still has a lot of capacity, while Australia has a lot of coal. And, uh, the, and South Africa, they, uh, they, they are the, the real swing, swing supplier. And now increasing the supply, their supply to the coal. So, uh, but because uh, the, the coal has, uh, unlike LNG, the coal is, uh, has a very uh, flexible, uh, liberal, you know, the, the, uh, the trading regime due to its uh, character. So if, uh, especially the, the, the Colombian coal can be competitive in price terms, even if we add the kind of extra uh, transport cost, then, uh, well, uh, they, they, they can be. But, uh, but I would say that it all depends upon the market conditions. Yeah, thank you. Hi, Jane, thanks for hosting all of us. Um, my name is Meredith Miller. I'm from the National Bureau of Asian Research. Um, and thank you very much for the very interesting presentation. I was wondering if you could repeat the statistic you offered about what kind of gains would be available from the implementation of um, ultra supercritical or supercritical um, power plants uh, in planned projects in Indonesia and other developing countries, non-OECD countries in Asia. And secondly, um, if you've done any analysis of what kind of a carbon price would make um, the use of that technology uh, more competitive. Thank you. Uh, what I said in my presentation was that uh, the if uh, all those uh, subcritical plants under development in India and in ASEAN states, including Indonesia, were completed with the latest existing technologies, so super ultra critical type of high efficiency coal power generation plants, it would save as much CO2 as would be saved by all the uh, wind turbines in Europe. So that's, that's what I stated. But, but I think it's, uh, it's a real uh, kind of a practical and realistic ways uh, in order to reduce the uh, CO2 emissions uh, in these countries because uh, the, they'll be using coal anyway. So, so that's, so the improving the, the efficiency, because that's possible with the existing technologies. So, so I think that uh, that's a real uh, the, the effective way to do it. And uh, uh, what was the second question? Uh, oh, you posed that what kind of a carbon price would be incentivized greater use of technology? Uh, well, I've been using this, uh, the, the carbon pricing issues in terms of the comparison of uh, the, the gas and coal. So, in terms of uh, increasing the, the, the efficiency increases, uh, I think it can be done even without the carbon pricing per se, because uh, that would reduce the, uh, the consumption of the coal if, if they, they can really the increase the uh, level of efficiency of those carbon, coal power generation plants. So it's, it's a kind of a comparison between the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the larger capex capital cost at the outset or the long-term benefits out of the improved efficiency. So, 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 so I don't think that the, 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 even without the carbon pricing, if we can come up with a kind of a, the good support to the initial investment phase, then uh, the, I think that should be possible because it pays in the longer term, yeah. But of course, the carbon pricing should help, I mean, of course, but uh, so, mm, I, I think it's a rather relative term. Um, 
I'm, I'm sorry, I have not done any that kind of specific calculations, but yeah. Thanks. Yes. Thank you very much. This has been very informative. For the microphone, please. Sir. If you could wait, for, since we're taping or um, uh, doing a live uh, stream or whatever it's called, uh, since I'm kind of taking a challenge, but if you can wait for a microphone, that would be a great help. Sure. Yes. Sorry about that. Uh, Brian Andrews with the Asia Group. Um, your presentation noted that uh, the U.S. regulatory environment is having some impact on U.S. coal demand, particularly with the retirement of uh, coal power to electricity production. I was wondering if you have a perspective or view on some of the U.S. changes announced last year where they would be uh, withholding support on IFE financing for coal power projects internationally. Do you expect that that policy change will have any impact on global coal consumption or demand? Or is this something you haven't really paid attention to, or it's just, you know, in the grand scheme of things, a, a drop in the bucket? So you're talking, your question is about the uh, kind of about the U.S. policy changes uh, uh, and the, the kind of impact coming from that to the international the right. deployment well, of the, uh, the carbon. And specifically the U.S. not supporting the financing of coal. Uh, I see, I see, I see. Uh, the, and that, that, I guess that would include the World Bank's uh, policy, multilateral uh, lending institutions policy against the uh, coal use. Well, well, thank you. Thank you for your question. Well, I would say that uh, in terms of the direct impact, if we take a look at the, how the, uh, the coal projects are financed, uh, the, the, uh, if you take a look at the whole supply chain of coal from the production to the, the, uh, the, and, and the consumption, including the power generation plants, uh, we consider that uh, the, the majority, most of the financing is coming from the private sector. And uh, the, uh, I'm not sure, about, but I understand that it would be something like a 5% is uh, provided by that uh, public uh, multilateral uh, finance, financing institution. So I would say that in terms of the direct financing impact, uh, the, the, we don't consider that to be a kind of, a, to have a serious impact on it. But, uh, but, but, but uh, in terms of the indirect effect, uh, the, I'm not sure. I mean, but, uh, but I would say that what is important is that uh, we really need to make sure that uh, needed uh, the efficiency improvement investment should take place uh, in those uh, developing countries, including uh, the Asia, Southeast Asia, and India, and China. Otherwise, uh, we may lose the window of opportunities uh, for reducing the CO2 emissions in, in a practical and realistic way. So... So I think that's something that we need to ensure, and that's part of the responsibility of the uh, developed economies. Thank you. If, if I can ask a quick follow-up question to that excellent question. Um, so uh, from what I understand, the ADV has, uh, the, 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 so the World Bank has pretty much followed the U.S. Treasury Department guidance, or however you call it, on the financing. From what I understand, ADP has not adopted that line of thinking. Um, to the extent you're comfortable, if you could share with me what sort of uh, discussions you might be aware of with among the Asian countries, because I think coal, as you um, uh, eloquently dis you know, uh, explained, I mean, it is still a very big player in the Asian uh, energy economy. Uh, so, thanks. Uh, the, um, I'm not a real expert on this uh, multilateral lending institution, so, so I guess that uh, there would be some others uh, who knows uh, better than I do. But uh, my understanding is that the, in, in the very discussion at the ADB, uh, especially those, uh, the, the Asian member countries' view is uh, somewhat different uh, from that of the United States. So they're more positive about uh, ensuring the uh, uh, investment money flow to the, the, the Asian uh, the, the coal power generation plants. So, so that's uh, the, uh, as far as I know in general, but, uh, but I'm not sure about the, uh, the very specific, uh, the, 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 yeah, the, uh, the policies of them. Thank you. Uh, but, but, I, but I also uh, would like to point out that uh, it's not only about the multilateral lending institutions, but we also have the bilateral, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the credit support institutions uh, uh, in various uh, the countries, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Ken Meyer, Court World Docs. Uh, one of the trends over the last decade, at least, with regard to oil, is the increasing cost of producing oil um, in terms of the energy return for energy invested. 
which is reflected in the price per barrel. Uh, if, if it was still $30 a barrel, nobody would be practicing hydraulic fracturing uh, or probably deep water drilling or mining tar sands. Uh, with regard to coal, is it not only cheap, but for the foreseeable, I mean, not only abundant, but uh, for the foreseeable future, uh, cheap to produce? At least in the uh, the uh, this uh, medium term outlook, I mean, uh, the, as far as we can see, the, we do not expect the coal to the coal costs to increase uh, drastically because uh, they are so abundant and uh, they still have the uh, resources that can be uh, the, the easily uh, exploited. So, so I, I understand that the situation is uh, rather different from the situation of oil, where uh, they have to go all the way to the uh, Arctic Sea or the very uh, deep sea resources or the, uh, the fracking. So, so, so I think uh, the coal is not, the days that the coal will move into that kind of a high cost stage is uh, very far, yeah. I'm Bob Hershey, I'm a consultant. Uh, could you tell us some more about coal conversion of how much would be to uh, synthetic natural gas and how much to oil? Uh, what kind of demand we're talking about? Uh, uh, the, first of all, I would have to say that uh, it, it depends. I mean, uh, they we're not so sure how much of the project uh, can be actually uh, be uh, implemented uh, because uh, it, it's, it, it, uh, there, there's a lot of uncertainties as to the environmental impacts. You know, uh, the when I first when I first heard that uh, the, the the coal to gas conversion may take place, I, I I thought that it's it's a good news. I mean, because gas is a lot more cleaner. But uh, this very uh, the gas to uh, the, the coal to gas conversion in uh, being considered in China actually would produce more CO two because uh, that would be more uh, that would be less efficient than burning coal itself. So, uh, of course, uh, they would do that uh, in order to, 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 to improve uh, their you know, handling of the energy sources because uh, the, the gas would be a lot easier to use in some occasions. Uh, but uh, but, but, uh, but, but, but uh, we, we have not. Uh, so uh, there will be more of the, uh, the environmental impacts coming from that. So it all depends upon how the Chinese regulatory authorities res would respond uh, to that. And also, uh, in order for the coal to gas, for instance, to work, there needs to be an access to the pipeline. So, uh, and uh, the, the, as you know, the China also has, uh, in, in the process of uh, developing the, the, the gas networks uh, in, in the country. So, so it also depends on the, uh, the transport uh, logistics uh, the, the, of that. And uh, what I'm looking at is, uh, so what was the size of the, uh, in this very report? I'm sorry, yeah. let, let me come back to it later because uh, there's an assumption in this, uh, in, in certain point, but that's not huge, yeah. But, uh, but, but I think that uh, the, uh, the, the, we are seeing the kind of uh, the rise in this technology in China and that could be uh, kind of uh, the major factor in, in the coal demand, yeah, thanks. Thank you. My name is Tom Cutler. I'm an independent consultant. So I have a question about coal trade. I noticed on one of your charts, you showed the drop in production from the Powder River Basin, which is a very large economic resource for coal in the U.S. And in another chart you had, you had a very thin line coming out of the Pacific Northwest for U.S. coal exports to Asia. So my question is, do you have any perspective on the prospects for increased coal exports from the Northwest U.S. to Asian markets, and how might that compete with U.S. coal exports out of the Gulf through the Panama Canal to Asian markets? Mm, I, I would say that the, the Powder River Basin is, uh, has a very uh, cheap, I think that's one of the cheapest, uh, the, the, the coal uh, that can be exploited uh, in the United States, but I also understand that uh, there's uh, the, 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 the problem of the uh, transport cost and uh, the export infrastructures with, the, with, with that uh, Powder River Basin, uh, unlike the Appalachian coal, which has a kind of a long years of tradition and uh, very uh, the endowed export facilities. So it all depends upon the, uh, the how those infrastructure can be developed and uh, also uh, the, the how the, the, the cost would uh, 
will turn out to be. I mean, so it's, uh, it, it, so it's up to the market. So, so we're not sure how uh, the, uh, those are the, 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 the resource will actually be exported. So, so that's, I, I would have to say that, that that depends on the market conditions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your question. Anyone else? Oh. Yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> Round two. <laughs> Uh, isn't pet coke competitive with coal for certain pet coke, petroleum coke? Isn't that competitive with coal for certain applications? And isn't China increasing their import of pet coke? And aren't we increasing our production of pet coke? I forget exactly why. It's got something to do with light oil versus heavy oil. Um. I'm sorry, I don't have, I don't think I have the data with, uh, with this uh, the report, so. Uh, the, I don't think the, 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 I have uh, any specific answer to that question. I'm sorry. Well, yeah. Is it competitive with coal for certain applications? And, and it's a lot more polluting, is Yeah, yeah. The, it could be cost competitive, but it all depends upon the various uh, the, the, the environmental regulations, and uh, so it depends on the circumstances, I guess. So, anyone else? Uh, so I guess I get to ask one last. Oh, sure. Uh, Guy Caruso, CSIS. Daisuke, I know the Chinese have been somewhat reluctant to partner up with IEA. You know, certainly at the at the level of membership, but but they are very active in things like technology. Is that true for the coal? Technology is that have the Chinese been active participants in cooperating with uh, our member, uh, using the term R as a oh, IEA yeah, member? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you very much for the question, and uh, I'm really happy to see that uh, you call the IEA as we our. So that's, it's nice. Eight years, it's Yes, uh, the I think there, there there's uh, some multiple uh, the factors uh, the around the relationship between the IEA and China, and of course, uh, well, first of all, the the IEA started in the 1970s as a kind of uh, the importers alliance uh, against the, uh, the, the the physical disruption of uh, the oil imports. And uh, at that time, IEA was created uh, under the framework of the OECD. So we have the OECD members as the IEA members. Not exactly the same, but basically. And uh, during the time, the OECD or IEA members uh, consumed around uh, three quarters of global oil. So that was, uh, uh, that was appropriate. But now we are seeing the more and more the, 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 the energy demand uh, coming from the non-OECD countries now. And the, uh, and uh, from la last year to this year, we'll see that the non-OECD oil demand will overtake the OECD demand. So that means that the IEA has only half of global oil consumption. And uh, that will lead to the question of uh, whether the, our emergency response regime is effective in case of physical disruption. So that leads to, that, le that forces us to work more with the uh, non-member countries. And right now, we are working on the initiative called the association. So uh, we are trying to create a kind of category of association partners and to work with the IEMO before becoming a members. And uh, the China is, of course, an important partner in that respect. And so we are doing a lot of work uh, projects uh, with China. Uh, in terms of the energy security, we think that the, the, the working with the, uh, the China is very important, and, but that's, that's not only about oil, but the coal, particularly, gas, uh, because uh, they are interested in how they can modernize their gas market, so uh, we are willing to uh, contribute to, to China in that respect, and also the various uh, climate change, energy efficiency technologies as well. So, uh, and uh, the, we think that we'd like to do more, work, work more with China. And uh, for instance, in, the, in, in case of the coal, for instance, uh, we, we have what we call the CIAB, Coal Industry Advisory Board. And uh, there are some major Chinese, uh, you know, the coal, coal power generation companies, uh, the, the, the coal companies uh, that are member to the CIAB. So on a private sector basis, we already have the, uh, the started to work with China. So all in all, uh, the, we would like to see more of the, uh, the 
uh, cooperation with China, but uh, it requires a lot of uh, work ahead of us. So uh, first of all, we need to build more confidence on, with each other. So uh, the so I'm willing to work whatever cooperative project with China uh, in that respect. Thank you very much for your question. Yeah. Well, it's uh, it's time. So please join me in thanking uh, thanking Sadamori San uh, for his excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks again for coming all the way here, despite the freezing uh, sub-zero well, Celsius temperature. And stay warm. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.